recording now. Marty, thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so just to give you a quick introduction, so we've got Marty Connell on today. I have a little uh, cheat sheet that I always use. Uh, I definitely wanted to get your, your stuff right today. <laughs> um, so just don't, just don't read it from the Wikipedia. <laughs> All right. Oops. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, basically Marty's uh, played on the Irish national team and played in the right. NBA for, from 92, 92 to 2000. 91 to 2000, yeah. 91 to 2000 for a number of different teams. I think your kind of prime was probably, you can tell me this better than I can, but like Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee Bucks, yeah. Boston probably, as well, just from like looking at the highlights, you had pretty yeah, yeah. significant number of years there. We also played for the Bullets, which are now the Wizards. The Wizards, yeah. Bulls no longer. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I know. I've been a Wizards a long time now. Yeah, no Bullets, no more Bulls, but I did play for the Bullets. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Did they actually, uh, this is not on the sheet, did you play with the, wasn't there a really, really tall guy who played for the Bullets back in the day? Yeah, George Mirasan. George Mirasan. Yeah, he was like seven, six I, or seven, eight. Yeah, I played with him right when he first came over. So this is 1994. He didn't speak English. <laughs> right. He was on the team and he didn't speak English. Wow. And then, you know, now, you know, he's like such a, uh, you know, fan favorite and everybody loves him. You yeah. know, obviously. But when I was there, he didn't speak any English. But, uh, yeah, I, I used to say he used to will himself up and down the court, you know, because he, he – Big. I mean, he was seven six, yeah. and I have a couple of photos with him and I together. You yeah. know, he, he, you know, I, he looks like I do with most people. You know, with me, you know, he's so huge. But he yeah. would will himself just up and down the court. You know, just pushing his body to the limits. But he could, he could dunk. The, he could. Dunk. That's how tall he was. Dunk the ball standing up. Yeah, just on wow. his tippy toes. He's definitely the tallest guy. I mean, I don't like a tackle falls is seven foot six. I want to say. Is he? Like, yeah, uh, maybe Bowl. not. Maybe not. New Bowl was really tall. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyone who could duck stand it up. I mean, you got yeah. a good shot in the NBA. I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I I can dunk sitting down. Just give me a cappuccino and a croissant <laughs> and both. <laughs> Sitting down, I can <laughs> Yeah, I could also do those dunks as well. Um, but uh, no, that, that's incredible uh, to, to have someone that size on a team. As you say, it makes you look feel actually normal. Yeah, yeah. You look like a normal guy. Yeah. You're 6'11", or are you actually 7 foot? No, no, I'm 6'10". I'm a legit 6'10". So I'm 6'9 and a half, you know, without shoes. Okay. So, you know, so, you know, that really pushes me up to 6'10". You know, obviously everybody in basketball usually adds an inch. Yeah. But, that's, uh, that's only in America, by the way. People in Europe don't do that. Actually, maybe that's wrong, but I, I get the sense that Americans seem to add an inch. I don't know yeah. if it helps with the recruitment thing or whatever. But yeah, I, I just think it's just a habit, you know, yeah. that you can just say, you know, extra inch just makes you – uh, that much more attractive on paper, you know. Granted, you got to go out and play. Yeah, I suppose it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. And now that there's more of an emphasis on things like, you know, like your your wingspan, things like that, it sometimes discounts that because I mean, ultimately yeah. you're you're releasing the ball from from the top of your hand, actually. So when you think about height, it, it's not as I mean, it's obviously important, but it's not as important as an inch or two. It doesn't make a big difference. Yeah, I agree. You need to jump as well, I suppose. But yeah, yeah, ultimately, if you can't play, it doesn't matter if you're six six or six seven or <laughs> yeah. if you can't play. Well, I mean, it, it should. But I mean, if you're six seven and you really take the game seriously and you're someone athletic, you should be able to get a scholarship to an American university. You know, you know, I think for someone in the states, you know, that should be their goal. You know, with basketball. You know, so that so let's say it's a young man. You know, it almost forces him to really study more, study harder, knowing that basketball, if you're six seven, six eight, even six six, if you work really hard in basketball and you have decent grades, you should be able to get a scholarship to an American university. And, you know, as we just mentioned prior, I mean, now that's just huge, huge savings, you know. Um, so I think if you're a young athletic guy that's tall, 
growing up in America or even growing up in Ireland, you know, work on the grades, you should be able to get a scholarship somewhere in the USA that's going to help you financially, you know, get through college. And that's, that's just a huge leg up. That's a huge advantage now going on for the rest of your life, you know. Yeah, that's true, Marty. And actually, one of the coaches that came on is an American coach. Uh, he's coaching a top high school uh, over in the States. And he, he was just saying how much, how valuable these are. It's like basically a quarter of a million pounds yeah. for a scholarship. And we, oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't quite think about it like that until he said it. But then when you think about it in terms of when you're training, I mean, maybe it's not always good to put a figure on things for younger kids to focus on that. But, but being yeah. realistic about it, that's roughly how much he said uh, yeah. a full ride scholarship, as in pay for your accommodation, pay for your tuition fees. Oh, yeah. He's a quarter of a million quid. When you say it like that, you're like, better go down and get some more shots up. Like when you, you, know, when yeah. you put it into actual uh, money terms. Uh, it's huge. So yeah, uh, just, yeah, you know, money terms are just like, you know, you know, the most people will have to take out debt, you know, and then, you know, carry that debt on, you know, through their twenties, thirties, you know, after they graduate. So, you know, it's just, it's just a way to think about it. But you know, that, again, that puts a lot of pressure on young people, you know, on, on uh, parents because they do see that, um, you know, so that's just something else, you know, I mean, get a scholarship, when I was young, it was important, but now university is so bloody expensive. Right. So it's even more so now. Yeah, and in the States, it's even more expensive, I think, yeah. than over here. I mean, they're just starting to bring tuition fees in over here. Then maybe, I think the UK just went up to like 9,000 when I did my master's. Uh, wow. I look, I actually got a basketball scholarship for a master's. It's fine. It's like still, four, like I think it was 14 for international students and nine for. Uh, for like a domestic, uh, wow. which is which is still a lot less than America because the, the oh, guys yeah. we brought over from college to do a master's as well to get scholarships, they were saving themselves fifty k or whatever um, whatever the yeah. the term is. So it's huge for for an American coming over to actually uh, yeah. the other way around almost like you know. Yeah. Um, so that's that's why a lot of them go and do a master's in Europe. I think now so it's almost like. You know, our, our younger players now, if you want to play in America, they can do the undergrad, but then the Americans can come back over and do a master's. So, oh, great. That works both ways. That's awesome. That yeah, awesome. there's a lot, lot of that going on in the British League, actually. Um, they don't necessarily have the funds to play the players for, for mm -hmm. like professional basketball league. Even it's not maybe one of the stronger leagues, but what they'll do is they'll give them a, yeah, the, a link up with the university, give them a, a postgraduate scholarship for sports. And then get them over. Now they don't always get the best players uh, coming out of obviously college because they go to professional leagues. Some of the ones you probably played in the Spanish league, etc. But yeah. so you, we end up getting like maybe lower, lower standard players sometimes because of that. Uh -huh. But it still works for both the club and, and for the player. Well, you know, this was this was my theory uh i worked in the nba office the corporate office and uh, basketball operations international so i used to travel a lot internationally in china and india promoting basketball uh conducting basketball clinics grassroots events like camps all the above and my idea for india obviously a giant giant market um was you know, India has all these great universities and the pressure for young people in India to, to get a placement in these universities is very difficult. And every university has usually a basketball court, has some sporting facilities. Create in India, if they could create a, like a college league, kind of what you were talking about, and part of the criteria for some of these young people to get into a university was not necessarily a scholarship, but just to get in was having basketball skill. And then let's say in each city, all the universities that, that you know, ring that city that are in that city would play a home and away season. That'd be a fantastic way for the game of basketball to really become very popular in India. So, you know, this, this was something that I was germinating in my mind when I was working for the NBA. It is about 10, eight years ago. Yeah. International. Yeah. Ideas. Yeah, no, it, I think the university model, it's, it's interesting because over here, 
there's a natural pathway, I guess, in America for the best college players to go through to the NBA and there's a draft. But I, I guess over in, for example, the UK, because I've been over there playing basketball, there's no real link between university basketball, for example, and then the BBL, which is the top league in the UK. So yeah. it's, it's kind of like the pathways cut off a lot of... Uh, some kids go to America and then they come back and they play in Europe in teams. So it's just, there's no natural pathway there. So I, I, I don't know, maybe in a country like India, I, I know there is a lot of pressure there. There's, there's sheer size of the population. Um, I worked with a lot of Indian people in the UK because I worked in tech, in the bank. And uh, yeah, there's just, I know there's a lot of pressure there to kind of get their grades. So I don't know how big the sport is there. I mean, honestly, I've, I've, I think it's one. not very big. Excuse yeah. me a second. What's up, dude? I'm talking to somebody on the computer. Uh, future basketball player I'm talking to, my son James. Oh, nice. Is, yeah. is he tall? Yeah, oh, yeah. He's, 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 he's only five. He's probably as big as you are. <laughs> he's only five. Okay, I thought he was older. I, I was like... He's, he's going to be a big boy, but... Uh, yeah, so, yeah, well, with India, you know, India doesn't really have a uh, sporting culture. Obviously, you know, cricket. Ireland, to me, Ireland is the strongest sporting culture. You know, every sport, everybody plays in Ireland, you know, yeah, everything. Sure. It's incredible. Yeah. But, you know, India, you know, there's such focus on um, academics. that I just felt that if you could carry basketball over to academics and be a criteria for schooling, you know, for, for young people, that would – force a lot of younger people, not force, but, you know, they'd also enjoy it, you know, for them to kind of open up to basketball. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know the kind of sport's been been taken global now. Well, it's been happening for a while, right? Um, NBA is global. I think, obviously, after 96 and, and the Olympics and all that kind of stuff, it's kind of propelled onto the, yeah. onto the scene. But then, even now, it's still, like, growing in every country. I think Ireland and, and UK... Because there's other traditional sports, it's always hard. It always seems like yeah. a minority sport. You know, you always have in Ireland the Irish sports like Gaelic and hurling. Uh, I don't know if you got to see any of that. But maybe we we'll chat about that. A oh, yeah, I did. Oh, did you? Oh, cool. Um, do you do you still watch Irish sports, or do you still get a chance? You probably don't get to see. Uh, well, what, what I what I do, but I'm I'm so busy now. But I mean, um, obviously, you know, it's it's great to watch it. You know, when I was there, you know, I would always when I was in Ireland, I always make a a day that I could, you know, watch it or, you know, obviously, you know, there in Gaelic Park would be, you know, such a blast, you know, so interesting. But like you said, it's something unique to Ireland that, you know, Ireland, sh you know, should hold on to. But, mm, uh, sure. but I mean, I I Ireland is such a sporting culture with those. And then, you know, golf is so popular. Then obviously okay. soccer, football is so popular. I mean, every sport, everybody plays in Ireland. And, you know, people do play basketball. It's not that popular, but usually everybody is somewhat comfortable with the basketball and have probably played in school. Yeah, it's true. Like, if you go to, even in the countryside, you'll see basketball hoops up in people's houses everywhere. I don't know if you saw it driving around the countryside. You'll see them everywhere. But it's the participation at a recreational level versus then, and then there's pockets of where there's clubs of actual, you know, uh, like talent coming out of in yeah. like Kerry, Pat Price, you probably know Pat. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and just like Dublin, there's obviously a huge in Dublin. Belfast has like started to see Belfast, that club there. Yeah. So there is pockets around the country where there's a lot of basketball player, players being developed, I suppose. So it's, yeah, but I, like you said, there's room for every sport. And like you said, most Irish kids are playing. Rugby's huge now in Ireland as well. That's a rugby, right? Right. Rugby's the other big one. So it, it's, uh, you probably lose some athletes at a younger age to, to things like rugby now because actually, uh, rugby has a lot of they're introducing a lot of the taller players into rugby as well so when you're oh, when really? your kids 40 yeah like i mean some of these guys are more, like i'm six six so they're in my size sometimes six eight now so you're starting to get that that kind of size of an athlete in rugby and they're looking for big guys you know who are strong not so, there's no crossover skills there as such like it's not like gaelic gaelic and basketball have a lot of crossover yeah. and you'll see guys playing both sports and doing quite well uh, but rugby just uh, it's just got so popular all the younger kids are playing rugby interesting I didn't know yeah. that I didn't know it's that. because the national team's done so well okay. now yeah. say, saying that they still lost to New Zealand there in the World Cup but uh, recently but in the Six Nations which is kind of 
England, Scotland, Wales, France, Ireland. Uh, the last 10 years, Ireland have been super successful. Um, and that's really kind of helped. You see the success at the national team level, then the younger kids want to play play rugby mm-hmm. and, the, and the clubs start to grow. So we're probably losing some athletes there. <laughs> so that's tough. And we've we've not been able to kind of have the same uh, success for the, the basketball team. In fact, the funding was cut pretty much after you left just because there was no... For, I guess sponsorship or whatever coming for for the national team. Yeah, the huge recession, you know, yeah, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So that probably didn't help. Yeah, yeah. It tends to be the first thing that goes is the corporate sponsorship, and then that you're kind of struggling then to. And I think it's such a expensive program to run the the, the senior men's team. So they probably, I think they just disbanded it or whatever. Uh, a couple of years, but it's back now, which is good to see. I don't oh, think good. we. Have, yeah, I don't think we have any Americans. Uh, uh, no, we don't. We don't. Uh, I'll actually. Do you know Pat Connaughton, the NBA player? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're, I think there's a bit of a mood to try and get him on, but again, I think he has to pay for his insurance if he wants to play or something like that. So I don't. Know. Um, but really? yeah, so uh, like, but we're just gonna, I think, play with the the kind of local players. So. I think that's so the kind are you, of, are you going to be playing on this on the team? Uh, I think I was got a message this year because it's my probably my last year. I'm 36 now, so I'm at the end of my kind of tether. I played in the Super League last year, the Irish League. Uh, I got a text to say that I was going to be asked to the trials, but there it was cancelled because of COVID. Um, so I, maybe I'll play next summer um, if it's still on. We're playing in the small countries, I think. So I don't know if you guys were in the small countries when you were on the team. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all yeah. We went to all of them, man. It was yeah. interesting. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell you what, we go back to your start because I, I, okay. I, normally, I normally just go back to the start of the journey and we go through it, but I just thought we'd just, we'd oh, just sure. jump into whatever. Uh, okay, so I've got some notes here. You can set me straight again. Right. Some of them are Wikipedia, some of them are not. So, uh, okay, so you're from, uh, you're from the Bronx. I read that you're from the Bronx. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, you know, born in the Bronx, but, uh, you know, I grew up, you know, outside the Bronx, you ah, know, uh, okay. Bronx, the Yonkers, but, you know, right there, right on the border there. Okay, and then you went to a school, and is it like, I mean, I've never been to the Bronx, I just watched a movie called The Bronx Tale, it's about as much as I know about the Bronx, is it actually like that, or is it like? Uh, not country? anymore, you know, that was back in the old days. Okay. Uh, different now, um, it's actually not too that bad now, you know, it used to be dangerous in the in the 90s, no, in okay. the 80s and 90s, but, you know, New York got a lot safer, as you know, so it's... Uh, it's not like that anymore, but uh, you know, it was definitely always a basketball. Yeah, you know, some of the basketball big tall guy, you know, to be right there in New York, you know, um, you know, playing against all those great teams. So you know, my high school, we played against a lot of the legendary teams. Like Power Memorial was a high school, it's still longer, but it was on the west side of Manhattan, and that's where Kareem Abdul-Jabbar went to. Wow. So yeah, so I was in that that powerful Catholic the Arch our uh Archdiocese League. So it was all the big uh you know, Catholic high schools like Cardinal Hayes, St. Raymond's, um, Rice High School, Power Memorial that were in the city and they were always powerhouses. So, you know, a lot of those high schools, you know, a lot of players left there went to have great college careers and then many of them went to the pros. So I used to play against a guy named Millie, unfortunately no longer with us, but he he was the star and he went to uh where did he go? He went to Talentine High School and that was like a that was like that was in the Bronx and you know that was like just like a factory where they, a lot of great players would come out of. Interesting. Like New York so I know when people from New York talk about New York. Is there a different style of basketball in New York than you said? And is it like more up and down, or is it more? Because uh, I've heard people just talk about New York basketball and they're. A, a yeah, you know, I can, I can only talk about you know when I was a young man. You know, I've been out of you know the New York area, but um, <laughs> all right, Daddy's on the phone. That's uh, my other son, Charlie. Uh, but yeah, but back in the day, you know, New York uh, was always a faster level of basketball. Um, so many of the players played outside, you know, outside courts, you know, that outside shooting was maybe not as important as to other places because so many of the players developed just playing pickup basketball, you know, off on the street. I'm not saying me, but other guys. 
So, uh, you know, it was really aggressive to the basket. It was known as a more aggressive band, uh, faster brand of, of, of basketball. Um, you know, that was always kind of back, you know, now I'm going back 30 years, you know, obviously things have changed since then. But, you know, w- when I was coming up, that's what it was known. And then a lot of those players went to Eastern colleges and played at big Eastern colleges or, you know, there was always a pipeline of, you know, great players from New York going to North Carolina, um, going to, you know, Virginia, those types of schools. So um, it was definitely, you know, for a guy that loved basketball, it was definitely, you know, a good place to grow up. And, you know, there was always uh, games going on. There was always outdoor courts. Um, you know, it, it was it was exciting. Cool. Um, I mean, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like you've in a kind of very competitive with all those powerhouse schools that you talked about, that that kind of helped you develop a lot if you're playing against top level talent in New York, then that's yeah, that's obviously yeah. helped. At this point, you're are you are you your full height then? Did you had you grown to like six? Yeah, I probably you know, probably but yeah, maybe maybe in shorter. But by my senior year, I was about six eight, six nine. Okay, um, you know, obviously, you know, a lot lighter. I was uh, you know thinner. I was I was skinny as a rail. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was imperative to, for me to hit the weights, um, hit the, by, by being hitting the weights, you know, that's a cliche, that's a saying, you know, that means by doing weight training. Yeah, yeah. Weight training. And, um, you know, and I saw that become a big deal in the 1990s. When I started in the NBA in 1991, 92, there was, there was no uh, fitness coach, there was no weight training coach on any of the NBA teams. Wow. And within four or five years, each team had a strength and conditioning coach for the NBA because that was so important, you know, because just the size of the players were getting so big and strong that, you know, everybody really needed to to lift weights. Um, You know, not obviously like a a bodybuilder, you know, there's obviously flexibility, but you really couldn't play in the NBA if if you didn't lift weights and you were a very strong guy. In the 1990s. It no, came that late. I actually would have assumed that, like, in the late 80s, that could, maybe people were starting to do it or starting to see the benefit of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so then, uh, okay, so you're 6'10", you're in high school. Um, and at this point, are you playing a kind of um, – because I can see from just from watching the NBA highlights, at least, that you were kind of – I almost argue you were a stretch four – even before the thing was kind of... Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't consider, yeah. I don't know if I could play now. I don't know. I mean, it's they're yeah. so bloody good now. Uh, the stretch four didn't come in. You know what was really big? Um, w- where I, I would say excel, but it helped my development or helped me get in the league was there was a lot of pick and roll basketball. Pick and roll, yeah. Even more than now. So... Um, and then I was able to pick and pop. So it wasn't really picking, setting the pick and rolling to the basket. It was more I was setting a pick and then popping, hitting that open jump shot. Um, so there was, a, there was a good deal of that. Um, you know, I think the game, the NBA game is better now. I think uh, I'm going back 25 years. Um, a lot of it was isolation basketball. Right. Which I didn't like at all. You know, some teams really, you know, you, some teams like, for example, the Utah Jazz, they played a lot of ISO, uh, obviously, for isolation basketball. And then there was rules that, you know, if, if, if you're there, you, if you're guarding a player, you couldn't help so much. And there's all these uh, different rules. And there just wasn't a lot of movement, you know, in basketball. So I think – Two things. One, they, they tweaked the rules uh, about 20 years ago to make more passing. And I just think with all these um, non-American players coming in, uh, Manu Ginobili, uh, Tony Parker, um, you know, obviously I could go through the whole list, uh, Pau Gasol, Dirk, you know, the, these players, Steve Nash, uh, they played with uh, more fluid. Now, was it maybe because of the, they played soccer or probably mm-hmm. more there was – different emphasis and coaching where they came from, but uh, their offense was much more fluid. And, and, and I think that's kind of taken over in the NBA and it's a much, much better uh, product, I think now. Yeah. Well, offensively, offensively. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, 
It was interesting because the, the highlight that I watched, I think the, I, I, I meant to say this to you, the first time I, I actually came across your highlights, I was in Scotland. Um, it's just a funny story. Obviously, you don't know about this, but I mentioned it in the email. Um, I was in Scotland at the time studying in university and I had a Scottish mate. He was, he was on the Scottish national team and I was trying out for the Irish national team. And you had just left. Uh, you had just been on the team. And, and I said, oh, it's a pity I didn't play last year. There was two ex-NBA guys, uh, Pat Burke and Marty Connor. We'd love to have met them. I was like, I uh, saw so, so Pat Burke, but I didn't really know of you. And that's just because I didn't watch basketball back then in the 90s because we didn't have the terrestrial channels on TV. So I knew who the big guys were, but I, I wouldn't have been able to watch the games to know who everybody was on the team. So I, he's like, but he was a basketball buff. And he knew everybody. And he's like, Marty Conlon, he was like, Oh, he's a baller. Let's, like, he goes, come back to the house. I've got a DVD with a game on him. So we went back to his house and uh, we watched, I don't know if it was you, the Celtics. Uh, and actually, I found the clip uh, on, on YouTube. And uh, it was just funny because the clip, uh, we were just having a few beers, basically, and relaxing and watching the game. And wow. we used to love to do that. And uh, we just started going crazy. Like, every time you scored, <laughs> we started shouting. And you had yeah, there's a there's a YouTube clip uh me against the Warriors. Is it the it Warriors? Up. Yeah, and I think uh, Rick Fox uh, comes off and you get subbed on. Yeah, and then you didn't you didn't hit the like the commentator was like he hasn't hit the rim yet. <laughs> and it, it was a lot of like what you said, you kind of got the ball. It was very much ISO basketball. I kind of forgot how how much it was like that back then, but it was very much um yeah, you just got it faced up and then you kind of had a you had a little kind of a it was either face up and take the shot, or, 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 or you do get a head fake and then get them up in the air. Yeah. And I was going to ask you about that because you were kind of famous for the. You almost became famous for for this head fake. I, yeah, I, 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 I like clever. to call it shot fake. Yeah. Shot fake. Yeah. Shot fake. Shot yeah. Because yeah. you lifted the ball. Yeah. yeah, I was teaching some young guys today here in Connecticut the shot fake, and I said when you shoot a shot fake. Everybody watching the game, everybody in the gym, stands, opposing players or team, you got to think you're going to shoot the shot. The only person in the gym who knows you're not going to shoot the shot is yourself. And I would, you know, I always teach about getting the ball, staying low, getting the ball over your hairline. See, this still, look, I'm 50 years old, I still have some hair. So <laughs> get the ball over your hairline is to make it believable, you know, because you, you're an actor, you have to sell it. That's so, true. So my probably my most, you know, the move that I used the most was, especially posted up, was catching the ball and then an inside pivot. And it was called the Jack Sigma move back in the day. Yeah, I set a pivot and from the outside, a pivot from the inside. So I catch it, I'm low, I'm ready to go. And then right from that inside pivot, I shoot it, make or miss. Usually the player's now thinking, the player being the defender who's guarded me, oh, I know the guy's move. He's going to do that inside pivot. And he's going to shoot it. I'm going to block it. And then you do the pump fake, and then you know that's the counter you add there. You kind of just build up from there. So, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I loved it. And actually, why? I have a question just on that particular. I know it's quite technical, but how come the inside pivot was it just because you could then rip through if you if you went, went to shot fake and then? Yeah, and then you know the inside pivot, you see the whole floor. You know, the outside, if you do the outside, there, there's a moment that you're kind of blinded. But if you're low, catch it low, and you turn, you know, you're ready to, you know, you're in triple threat, and you turn, you're right there, and you see the whole floor in front of you. Okay. So if you turn, if you turn around the outside, then you can't, you're still going There's to see a, the rest of the course. Exactly. There's like, you know, maybe like a second there that you're blind. But if you turn okay. inside, boom, you see the whole floor in front of you. And then, you know, I wouldn't teach the inside pivot maybe to some like overpowering players. Um, you know, physically, but, you know, obviously I was, you know, playing against some of the, you know, great athletic specimens that I played against, I was overpowering. So that kind of created space for me to open the shot up. Okay. So, you know, okay. inside pivot kind of create that space and then shoot the shot. And then you kind of add on, you know, pump fakes and, you know, all sorts of little, you know, tricks. You know? Yeah. That, I really like that. I mean, I, I've, as I've gotten older, I'm starting to see that like sports, generally is a lot about misdirection so one of the things that you were doing there is basically getting them to think you're doing this but actually as you explained there you're actually doing something else but the whole idea is to get they them to use that term in um in uh, soccer football misdirection 
Not really. Eh, not really. I don't think people talk about it. I like that term. It. It's direction. I want to use that. You know? Yeah. It's, it's like, uh, I know this sounds w- a weird uh, analogy or, or, or weird um, comparison, but like Kung Fu, for example, and MMA, they, they use a lot of misdirection. So I just started re- watching that recently and they talk about misdirection a lot. So they'll, they'll go to, I don't know, punch, for example. I don't know anything about the sport, but they'll, they'll go to punch, but it's a fake to set up something else. And it's just, I, I noticed that in basketball, you, you know, you're doing that with the, to move the zone, you'll fake the, the yeah. pass and then throw it over the other side. So it's a lot about misdirection, but it's not a term that's used. It's sometimes used in basketball, but I think that's the idea, right? Just to kind of get them to yeah. think. Yeah, well, I love that term, misdirection. Misdirection, yeah. So that's the one I came across to watch an MMA because Conor McGregor kind of blew up when I started watching that. And it's oh, really yeah. interesting. So that's the only reason I started watching that. It's got very big, actually. Um, but yeah, no, it was just a, it was just a fantastic shot fake, as you as you call it. Uh, it's probably because yeah. right uh, it's not just your head. And it was interesting you said to bring the ball up above your head because I'm pretty sure when I shot fake, I've always brought it to about my chin or my face. But I mean, it doesn't really sell it the way no. you the way you're selling it. In the, and clearly that worked because Chris Weber, I think he has a video of him saying, uh, "Oh, Marty Common was one of the hardest guys to guard." He goes, "I I subbed on to mark him." And uh, he basically said, just don't fall for his shot fake. He said it to the whole team. <laughs> and he still fell for the shot fake. So you must have sold it pretty good if he kind of was going to, if Chris Weber, I don't, I don't know how good Chris was at defense, but um, was there anyone that you found like difficult to guard? Because you, you came on and I mean, you put points up every time you came on. From Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the best post player I ever played against was uh, Hakeem Olajuwon. Ah, yeah. He was the Rockets. Um, I mean, there's one one game. He t- fourth quarter right on the uh, left block. I mean, he torched me for like 14, 16 points in, in the fourth quarter, and he did it so effortlessly. You know, it was you know it was uh, you know it was so finesse, and his footwork was so amazing. And then he just drop and shoot. Um, he's definitely probably the most uh, the, the the best post player that I ever played against. You know. Um, you know, his footwork was amazing. Um, he, and, he, you know, he wasn't a huge player. You know, he was about 6'10". Yeah, eight, six, right. 11, But he wasn't like a 7-footer. He was a 7-1. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I would say definitely, you know, he was probably the best, uh, you know, in my position, the best player I ever played against. Yeah. I mean, he's probably considered one of the best bigs of all time. He you, don't wasn't. To, you don't have to say that, man. He was Incredible. Gifted. I mean, if you even see him, um, uh, I watched some videos with him, and he's kind of coaching guys like Dwight Howard and some of these newer guys in the NBA. Uh, they're not really the the same kind of back to the basket players as as maybe he was. Uh, he faced up as well, actually. He didn't need a lot, and he could shoot. I mean, he could kind of do everything. But uh, you can just see the finesse, and the, the he just glides along the the course, and he's just everything's done very smooth. And the shot fakes. So he was another guy that did shot fakes and kind of stepped through. Um, yes, yes, he had that beautiful up and under step through move. Remember yeah. that? Yeah, I, it was so. just beautiful to watch. And he might do multiple shot fakes. You know, he'll bring yeah. the ball right up. And again, like actually, just thinking about it, he would bring the ball right up as if he's going to release it and then take it back yeah. down again. So there was a lot of that. It's actually less a less used skill. Like step throughs don't really happen as much in the NBA. I don't see them as much. You know, yeah. uh, you know, I don't see that much post up basketball. You know, like you mentioned the. The, the term stretch four, you know, that's like kind of like the, the term. New school, yeah. Uh, but you just don't see as much post-up basketball now that, that you did 20 years ago. Um, you know, I don't know why exactly people have gone away from that, but like you said, Dwight Howard, you know, didn't really, you know, he, he didn't have a lot of great, great post moves. Yeah. But maybe that's what the coaches wanted. They want him just to finish at the rim. You know, they wanted other players to, to make plays and then, you know, he could finish. But um, it's just, you know, that's what makes the game great, you know, how it kind of goes through different uh, styles, you know. Yeah. It um, seems to have evolved a bit to, like, the big man just kind of – he did a lot of – he would get position on a guy, but he'd end up, like, spinning off them and taking a lob or something like that. So that's – I guess that's more kind of using his athleticism. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's still effective. He's still playing for the Lakers now. Actually, he's still he's still pretty good. But you're right. He didn't do a lot of back to the basket stuff. No, he's kind of added it in. Yeah, yeah, like guys like 
like a LeBron James, he's he's actually worked on his game and has some inside yeah. stuff as well. But you're right, a lot of centers now they're stretch centers or they're you know yeah. the new, new school kind of able to shoot the three, positionless basketball. They're talking about yeah. like so it's kind of a uh, it's very different to the, to the old style where it was. Uh, me personally, I actually prefer because if you get the ball inside out, then you're obviously opening up a lot. For me, you're opening up a lot more, and those inside touches actually really help us. Uh, there's probably a philosophy is a argument for both and both can work it's almost at this point like like uh, the Golden State Warriors kind of shown that you can almost do it without a, a, a legit big man uh, which is crazy but yeah um, okay we kind of I'll go back to the, uh, the the journey here so after high school then um, you went to college in Providence correct Providence, Rhode Island. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That was uh, yeah. We played in the uh, Final Four. That's right. Yeah. And then my teammate was a uh, great guy, man. He's a great guy. Uh, his uh, his son might actually play in in Ireland next year. You ah. know, the whole thing. Billy Donovan. Ah, okay. Yes, 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 yes. So he, he's a, he's he's a coach now at uh, Oklahoma Thunder, Oklahoma That's City. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So his so, son might play in Ireland. Yeah. His son just graduated from Roger Williams in Rhode Island and played like Division Two basketball, or, you know, something like that. No Division One, and he and he still wants to keep playing and that kind of stuff. And you know, they're obviously, um, you know, Irish Irish Americans. So uh, we've we've been working maybe you know maybe get him over here you know in a situation like maybe some such situation like you had in the UK, you know. Um, doing masters or just, you know, playing. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I digress. This, that's his son, Brian Donovan. But I played with his dad to coach the Oklahoma City Thunder at Providence. Ah, uh, cool. Um, and you were under uh, Rick Pitino there? Yeah, you know, the guy, you know, he's gotten in a lot of trouble. But, yeah, you know, he was a young coach then. And, um, yeah, we went to the Final Four. It was uh, very oh. exciting. We played, um, we played in the Final we played Syracuse in front of sixty-five thousand people. Wow, that's amazing. yeah, yeah. It was pretty. It was pretty wild. Yeah, New Orleans was pretty cool, man. You know, it's, uh, you been, have you been to New Orleans? I've never been to New Orleans. I haven't yeah, been to New Orleans. Place, man. Yeah, you gotta go. You gotta yeah. go. It, that's on the list. That's on the booking list for me. I really want to go there. But you guys got to go down and play. Uh, it was in New Orleans. The final four was it? The final four, yeah. Yeah, we lost to uh, Syracuse. You know, they had a – oh, my God, they had a crazy team. They had Derek Coleman, Ronnie Sykley, Sherman Douglas. They had, like, three, four NBA guys on the team. So, uh, you know, they were really good. But, um, yeah, it was exciting. You know, college, college basketball was tough, you know, because, um, you know, you're almost on a professional team with those kinds of uh, pressures, uh, you know, playing in front of the crowds, people that want you to win. And – you know, you're in a dorm room, you know, you, you're doing your own laundry, you know, you got to go to school. So it was, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy experience, but, um, you know, I definitely uh, put my time in there and then, um, you know, things worked out that I was able after that, after I graduated from Providence, uh, I played in the CBA, the minor leagues. Yeah, I got that. Uh, I got the team. Here. That's, what, that's where I really improved. Ah, right. Interesting. Yeah, that's where I really improved, you know, because um, in the CBA, they, they don't play 40 minutes. They play 48 minutes like the NBA. So it's the NBA style game. Right. And uh, um, I was fortunate. I got to Rockford, Illinois. That was, you know, it's mostly Midwestern cities there in the States. They all play each other in, you know, small arenas, 3,000 people, 4,000 people. And um, I was fortunate to get some playing time. And so, you know, pretty much I was playing three, two, three times a week NBA basketball, you know, NBA style basketball. And, um, you know, I wasn't drafted from the NBA. So, but as you know, in basketball, you're only allowed to play five guys. So even if you're drafted and the team likes you, if they have other players, you know, you're pretty much just collecting dust on the bench. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of those players didn't really improve. But I went to the CBA, so my first year I was playing all the time, every day in the CBA. I was fortunate I was playing a lot, and uh, it was really an amazing experience. That's amazing. Really you know, I mean, 
you know, I really loved it. You know, I mean, just think, you know, I was thinking, like, look, I'm in my 20s and I'm playing basketball every day, you know, you know, playing mm-hmm. in the league, you know, and I was getting like 35 minutes a night, you know, so I was playing pretty much the whole game. So it was, uh, you know, I, re- I really, you know, wasn't necessarily, you know, Madison Square Garden or playing at Staples Center, you know, with the LA Lakers, but still, I, I really enjoyed it. I was playing a lot and, you know, I love basketball. So it was, it was definitely an interesting experience. And the CBA at the time, I don't have a lot of kind of context on this, but like, because I found that team that you play for, are they, uh, like, what's the, there was, there, there was some players, good players in, in, in those leagues. Like, it wasn't like, oh, yeah, man, now. Really good players, yeah. Right. A lot of the, a lot of the, really the good, good players, players were in that league. I'm pretty sure Dr. J played in the CBA and then switched over or something like that. No, he played in the ABA. Oh, ABA. Oh, ABA. Yeah, it's different, different. Uh, so the, the CBA is like the D-League now. So think right. of the NBA D-League. Gotcha. It was just like that, but there wasn't relationships with clubs in the CBA with the NBA. You know, you could be uh, brought up for a 10-day contract, but now kind of what I touched on earlier, actually, it, it's much it's much better. Um, it's almost a feeder system now. So it's much better. So let's say a team drafts a player, you know, mer- first round, mid first round. That player can go to the D League, develop, work with that organization's coaches. So each organization has a minor league D League team that they're associated with. Yeah, that's right. And so now they're improving. They're getting better. They're playing NBA rules and all that. So. Um, it's, it's much better. And now the D league is very, very popular. You know, the CBA was not that popular, but the D league now has become like a real popular brand of basketball. And it's great because, you know, you see a lot of players now they are going to become NBA stars and you can see them in smaller cities. So, you know, it's really great for the fans. Yeah, that's true. Actually. I think I actually, I mentioned tackle falls. Uh, I think my battery's about to go. Uh, Marty, let me just quickly grab the charger. I didn't actually plug it in. I know I'm going to plug it in. Just bear with me one sec. I sorted that out anyway. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, it sounds like I lost my train of thought. <laughs> We're talking about the CBA. CBA, yeah, CBA. I mean, the Continental Basketball Association. Ah, right, okay. So the, the G League, uh, yeah, as far as I can see, yeah. they, they, did, they don't actually seem to. Uh, one of the guys I played with in Germany, he went to play in the, I think it was called the D League back then. The Are they calling it the G League now? called G League now, but I think they, they, yeah. it was called 2008. It was called the D League. Yeah. 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 And, and he went there and he, he played, but he didn't get any minutes. And he ultimately wanted to try and get into the NBA. But I think just like the very top guys, you have to do really well and almost kill in, in the in, in the D League or the G League yeah. um, to get in there. So he just kind of, uh, you know, he just basically didn't, didn't get the opportunity of the minutes. So, yeah. I mean... Do you think it's like with that to get that extra step? Like sometimes the talent will just take you through if you're at a, a big college and you're just on TV and people notice you. But then do you think there's sometimes there's like a bit of the right situation, just getting the right minutes with the right coach? Yeah, right team. yeah. It's a little yeah. bit of that too. That's what happened to me. I, I got so I was I was in the CBA twice. My second time, I got a, a, a call up. That's the term when they call you up from the CBA to the NBA. Uh, and I was fortunate because I went to the Charlotte Hornets, you know, okay. back, it's going back some time now, but they were decimated by injuries. So I had an opportunity to play with them a lot and they played a fluid open game, which was good for me. 
But, you know, I could also went to a team and say, I got a call up, I'm, you know, doing really well in the CBA. And I got a call up to a team that just needed a player for league rules. And I could have just sat on the bench for 10 days and been down. So, you know, I was fortunate to kind of, you know, an opportunity opened up where there was real opportunity for me to get some real substantial playing time in the NBA. So in that case, I was very lucky. And how, like, I mean, at the time, do, do you just think like you get the call up, you just think, oh my God, <laughs> here we go. We're, we're in the NBA or was, how did that feel for you as a young player? Like I, I, you're in the CBA, which is, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it was very exciting. You know, it was, uh, uh, you know, um, it, it was, uh, yeah, you know, it happens real quick, man. You just gotta, you gotta go, you know, like I said, I, I was very fortunate because I was in really good shape because I was playing every day in the CBA. So I could, you know, go, it wasn't like I had to like kind of adjust. I was playing those league rules. I was playing the same amount of, you know, same rules and everything like that. And I was in really good shape. So, you know, you just kind of hit the, hit, hit the ground running, man, you know? Yeah. And before you know it. Yeah. So, I mean, like, and then you ended up having it like a, 10 year stint in the NBA and like just from watching the NBA I mean you can see really talented players come and go from the NBA I mean talented players you know and you see them yeah. they're in other leagues and stuff and even young players that come in and, and they just don't have a good year and then before you know it, unless you know the next year they're not in the league you're like where's that guy gone and he's just dropped yeah. out of the league so to be able to stay in the in the league for for 10 years and and, and at one point you were like averaging I think 10 points a game or whatever yeah. uh, in the league I mean that's for me. That's incredible. That was Just, awesome, man. It, I tell you what, there's nothing better, man. When you're in a uh, NBA rotation, you're playing 82 games a year. You know, you have a lousy game on Tuesday. Don't worry, because there's a game Thursday. Yeah, you know? that's true. Yeah. You know, and then you yeah. then you have a good game, and but you can't, you know, feel too great about yourself because you got a game Sunday. And if you have a lousy game, don't worry about it because you have a game next Tuesday. So. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a hectic schedule. Yeah, it is a crazy schedule. I, but it really is a dream come true because, you know, I mentioned in, you know, college, you know, you're going to school. You're in a, you know, just a small little dorm room. You know, you, you, you have to take care of laundry. You have to take care of all those other things. In the NBA, you know, you have a nice apartment. Um, you know, you have a nice car. You're traveling first class, you know, you meant most of the, you know, sometimes you, you fly commercial, but most of the time it's charter jets, private jets. So it's like, you know, all you really have to do is focus in on basketball, basketball. you know, okay. all those other things are kind of pushed aside. So, um, you know, it's when, when it's going, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we could talk for hours. I have a ton of questions to ask you about that. Those, like, sure, the go ahead. like, yeah, it, it, was there ever? Do you have any memories of like playing against? Uh, I, I, I found a photo of you like Larry Bird was on the court. Did you ever hear him? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Trash my, talk stories or any good stories? But it was a big thrill because you know, um, you know, I was always a Celtics fan. You know, growing up, you know, he was older than me, but I, I was able to play against him. My rookie year was his last year. Ah, so right. That was, that, was, that was a big thrill. Um, but, you know, I played against um, the the 96 Bulls when they won 70 games. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> they won 70 games in Milwaukee, um, and I was at that game. Um, you know, so, you know, you, you know, I played against Michael Jordan, which was a thrill, you know, um, which, you know, I think we talked about. And then um, – uh, Scotty Pippen, um, Dennis Rodman, all those guys, man. It was, Co -co coach and yeah, it was really cool, man. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, you, you, you want to think of them as colleagues, so you know you can't be like, oh Put hey, up on a kind of stuff, yeah, or you know, be all over them. So you know, you just got to be like, hey man, what's up? You know, <laughs> <laughs> trying to be cool with them, yeah. I, well, I would that... be cool with them, but you know you. You, you, you know, you just got to, you know, they're players and you just got to go out and try to do your job, you know. That's true. Did you yeah. did you ever feel starstruck? Like, let's say, for example, against the Bulls, did you ever, was there a point at which you were kind of going, oh, Jesus, that's Michael Jordan? Because I have heard other players say stuff like that, NBA Yeah, players. no, well, I, I, I think, was I talking to you about this or was, was somebody else? My, my, my rookie year, we played the Bulls after they won their first championship 
uh, I think in Kentucky, somewhere in Kentucky. You know, it was a preseason game. It wasn't. Ah, a, yeah. And, uh, you know, you're shooting around, players shooting around. And, you know, I, I knew some, you know, players that would become stars in, in college and stuff. And then, you know, I remember watching the TV shows and my parents tell me how big the Beatles were. You know, the music group, the Beatles, the rock and roll, you know, Paul Hardy, John Lennon, and mm-hmm. how huge they were. And um, so all of a sudden, you know, Michael Jordan came out just to shoot prior to the game. And it was like, just bedlam. It was just like people were screaming, people were going crazy. And I just, the first thing that came to my mind was like, this this is how it must have been when the Beatles, you know, were in their prime and the fans would just go absolutely crazy. So it wasn't like I was starstruck, but I was like, whoa, you know, this is taking, you know, Next level. I haven't seen a star like this, you know, before, you know, just people going nuts. It was, it was, it was, it was wild. It was you. It was hysteria because even in the documentary, the um, the last dance. I don't know if you've seen it. Did you watch it? Or yeah, I watched some of it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see just how crazy it was, and it's a perfect example to say the Beatles because that's what it looked like. People were literally yeah. mobbing him everywhere he went, yeah. and, and there's, there's that kind of really interesting footage of him just with his cigar sitting on curled up on a little bench. And being like, I don't want to go outside. This is like, it seemed like almost like that that whole pressure that he's yeah. been put under. He didn't really love it. Yeah, yeah, I imagine it must have been, man. It was, it was insane, man. It was absolutely insane. That's crazy. Um, yeah, I, as I say, I probably have a load of other questions, but your your your, be, your best year was um, in Milwaukee, but you said also you you love Boston. Which uh, do you have any like memorable like? games where you like you just kind of were on a high i know you said you didn't like to get too high or too low but yeah what I'm was trying your to favorite think, year um, probably probably my you know I, I was with milwaukee and then the second game we played the lakers you know which you know was a, you know they weren't uh you know it's an iconic franchise and um you know i had a really good game got a big steal hit a couple of foul shots and we, uh, you know, that kind of iced the game for us, and we won. So I had the steal, and then hit a couple of foul shots. And that was only the second game of the year, but I think it was uh, probably one of the highlights for me because that really solidified me in the rotation, rotation. for the rest of the year. You okay. know what I'm saying? You know, that we kind of pulled that game out uh, against the Lakers. It was a home game in, in Milwaukee, so obviously it wasn't, you know, playoffs, but – uh, for me to kind of, you know, I was still trying to find my way the year before I was at the CBA, I had made Charlotte, and then um, we, we won in Philadelphia, then we played the very next day home against the Lakers, and we won that game against the Lakers, and I had a good game, and that kind of solidified my uh, rotation spot for the rest of the year. Yeah. So that's, it, that's probably a big highlight for me. Yeah, and that's interesting how you can put it down to one game, but it, it is like that sometimes. If, if you have one good game against a good team, the coach's confidence level goes up, and then yeah. you're, in the, you're in the rotation, yeah. and it's like you can almost say at that point was a, a hinge or whatever to yeah. kind of help you slip our spot. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, yeah. yeah, and you went on to have a really good year that year. Um, and as I said, you stayed in the league for, for the te- 10 years, which is incredible. Yeah, um, it was very fortunate, knock on wood, yeah. It was, you know, it's a great sport, you know. I mean, uh, you know, and then, you know, uh, like I said, when you're in that rotation playing three times a week, man, it's four times a week, man. It's as, as good as it gets, man. It's, yeah, yeah. No, it's, a, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. Um, okay, so as I say, like, there's, there's tons of other questions I'd have there, but there's other stuff I wanted to touch on. I don't want to keep sure. you all, all day. Um <clears throat> So then when did the kind of opportunity, we'll maybe talk about your stint in Europe, but I'll just go with the, the national team. How did that come about? And like, So, um, you know, we, I always had close ties to Ireland. Uh, my mother, uh, both her grandparents are from Donegal. No, no, both her parents from Donegal. So my grandparents are from Donegal. Ah, cool. So as a kid, I'd go back and visit. All right. You actually yeah, went as a kid. Yeah, as a kid, I would go visit Donegal. Beautiful, beautiful place. And then obviously, you know, you know, on holidays, a lot of folks would, you know, come to the States, you know, bounce around the States, see us in New York. And um, so I always had close ties. And my mother had an Irish 
uh, citizen, you know, she got this passport citizenship. So, um, so, you know, I got it and, you know, I understood it was going to help me professionally in basketball, you know, playing in Europe. And I just felt that, you know, since I had it and it's given me this opportunity it would be an honor, you know, a real honor to play for Ireland basketball. You know, I didn't know the whole situation. So, um, so, I, you know, I found out that there was, a, you know, that they, they were interested. And, uh, you know, then I started playing for Ireland. And, you know, I just met, met a lot of great people. Um, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was, it was a time commitment, but it was definitely worth it. And like I said, it was my honor, you know, to have an opportunity to represent Ireland. That's amazing. And did you know, had you, was Pat in the, in the league when he was, he had been in the Burke. Yeah, Pat Burke. Sorry, Pat Burke. Right. So, well, Pat, Pat and I go back because actually I was playing for Ireland at the time. He and I were teammates in Athens, Greece. So we ah. played 2001-2002 season for Marusi in Athens, Greece. Gotcha. And, um, yeah, we had a blast. And then he, after that, he went to the NBA ah. and I stayed in Europe. And then, um, you know, when he had opportunities, he would play for the Irish team. Obviously, you know, he couldn't do it all the time because he was playing in the NBA. Yeah, he's, I remember he played for Orlando, and then he played for the Phoenix Suns. Suns, yeah, that's right. He yeah, was making he all the skits the Suns, then in the Suns. That was very funny. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, and I, at that time, my NBA career was over, so I was staying in Europe. So, um, you know, I was, I was either playing in Greece or Italy, and then, you know, I would play for the Irish team. Ah, uh, okay. So, because you're in Europe, it probably was easier too with the, yeah. like the travel commitments or whatever. Like, and then Pat kind of could could play whenever he could make it, but he was well, in America playing the image. Well, I remember the first time it was tough because I was playing for Marusi, and then we had a road game in Serbia, came back to Athens, and then had a fly to Dublin, and then where did we have a game? in Cyprus, so no, the other end of Europe, you know, Cyprus, you know, it's like going from New York to California, you know I mean? It's so far from Ireland. Western, you know, obviously as west as you can go in Europe and as east as you can go. And we had a fly back to, I mean, it was definitely worth it, but it was, you know, it was, it was a commitment. And then after playing for Ireland, you know, so this was like in a November two week period, I'd go back and play for my, um, you know, Greek team. Greek team. Okay, interesting. Um, and did you kind of go visit when you were in Dublin? Did you go visit like your relatives? In Dublin? Uh, yeah, um, not that time, but um, when we had more time, I, I took a nice uh, visit up to Donegal to see the folks. And then I remember uh, it was great. Uh, a bunch of them came down to Dublin to watch us play a uh, big okay. match. It was against uh, Croatia. We lost that one. It was a good, really good game. And, uh, you know, they, they just, you know, they didn't, they heard that I had played basketball, but they didn't know that much about basketball. And then, you know, they were like, oh, I didn't know the game was so fast. And it was up and down. It's so exciting. And I go, yeah, you know, I go, that's the great thing about uh, basketball, that even if you go know a lot about the game, there's so much up and down shooting and blocks and, and passing that it's still exciting to watch, even if you don't know, you know, all the details of the game. Yeah, it's funny you said that because um, my uncle, he, he would I played Gaelic football as well uh, uh -huh. from a, from a county called Longford, and uh, actually played for the actual county team one year, uh, which was good okay. good experience. Uh, after the basketball uh, experience I had in Germany, they, my brother was on the team, and they knew there was a six foot six guy who could catch a ball, so they threw me into the county team. Um, and yeah, it was just interesting that my uncle. I'd never actually seen me play basketball, which was my mate, which was my my sport. So then he came up last year to the national. We got to the national cup final against uh, I don't know if you know Mark Keenan. Yeah, I know Mark. Yeah, Mark coached me. He was the national team coach, was he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's so assistant he, coach. Yeah, he's a Mark coach at Temple Oak, and we played against them in the in the cup final this year. And my uncle came up to the game. And he came out of the game, and he is a Gaelic man through and through. Like the, you probably know from, like Irish families, they just they have these families just obsessed with GAA uh, Gaelic sports, which is as you say is great because it keeps the heritage. But uh, he just hadn't seen basketball and didn't really 
I f- probably fully appreciate how much I, I loved it and maybe how good the game was. And he came out of the game and he was like, that was unbelievable. I, I'm coming to the next, I'm going to yeah. come to the next one. So yeah. it was great to see that a guy that was just yeah. a Gaelic man through and through just come and watch basketball and be like, that was brilliant. Like the, he loved yeah. it so much, which actually g- gave me a lot of joy because I was like, I finally see why I was walking around with a basketball all the time instead of, uh, instead of a Gaelic football because he wanted me to stay and play for the county team. And I was like, uh, I don't have the interest in it. I don't have the love for it. And he never understood why I didn't just stay and play county Gaelic. Uh, but I just love basketball too much. So I was like, yeah. that's the choice I'm making. So it was just interesting to hear that uh, yeah. they came down and didn't appreciate Like, did they know you played in the NBA? Did they? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, no, no. They, they knew all, of course. Of course, they knew all that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't know if they really understood the game of basketball that much or, you know, they never saw it live. And, uh, you know, they were really like, wow, it's really fast. It's so, you know, you know, how we got up and down the court. You know, that's what really kind of blew them away. Yeah. It doesn't always translate when you're watching it on TV. No. Just how, how especially when it's done at like a, a good level or whatever, you yeah. start to see just how uh, quick things are and just the, yeah. the ball movement and, and the physicality of it, actually, because yeah. I think he was surprised about that, too. Um, I think because Gaelic's a very physical sport. Uh, there's a bit of a knock in Ireland if, you pl- if you're playing something like basketball because it's considered non-contact. But uh, of course, as you start to, you know, watch the game, you realize that as soon as the ball leaves, yeah, there's a lot of contact. <laughs> it just doesn't necessarily have. I know it's kind of gone out of the game now, actually. And that was actually one of the questions uh, someone wants to ask was, "What's your view on basketball nowadays?" Uh, I put a little thing on Twitter uh, just to, just to get some questions. So. What's your view on basketball? I think they wrote down here. Today versus past NBA. Uh, this is my cold chest. Yeah, I touched on it earlier, but I think it's much better today. Ah. Um, a, lot, a lot of that has to do with a lot of the non-American guys coming in. Um, you know, them bringing the skills of shooting, of passing, of moving without the ball. Um, you know, I just felt that uh, during the 90s, it was, it was very, very physical. But the offense was very stilted. It was a lot of isolation. There wasn't a lot of ball movement. There wasn't a lot of shooting. Um, they tweaked with the rules, and now it's much more open. You know, I, I'm, all of it I'm not, you know, wild about. There's less post-up basketball, which I love. But just how the, the, the whole floor is spread and how guys now have to have those skills of shoot, outside shooting and ball handling. Um, you know, the players are more skilled now offensively, um, better passing now. I just think the game is, is, is in a much better place than it was maybe 25 years ago or 20 years ago. Interesting. I, yeah, I, I, would, I wouldn't have guessed you would have said that, but okay, that's just yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's true about the, the, there's, there's less uh, traditional posts, I suppose, or traditional yeah. centers. But, um, yeah, okay, that's that's interesting. There's another question here. <laughs> it's from Rian McGee. Uh, I don't know if you know this person, but they responded to my tweet. Uh, are you on social media, actually? Are you, are you not? Uh, not too much, a little bit, but not too much. I'm kind of an older guy, but yeah, not too much. You're, you're not a hashtag guy. Do you, do, you no, know what a, no. do you know what a boomerang is? If you don't know what a boomerang is, then... <laughs> What's a boomerang? Well, I know. Well, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's a, Australian. From Australia, <laughs> no. on social media, there's a thing called. I just I just joined Instagram uh, about okay. a month and a half ago when I started this podcast. I had no interest in joining it because God knows you spend enough time on like Facebook or some of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't join it, and then uh, I joined Instagram, and then one of the the younger girls at work was like, "Do you know what a boomerang is?" And I was, as you say, like, "Yeah, it comes back to you. It's an Australian That's thing, the Aboriginal, I, I, the yeah, device for whatever." Uh, so. Uh, she said a boomerang is when you take it like a three second clip and it's like just does the same thing so you just see this going back and forth oh, wow. so i just thought that might be the litmus test for whether or not you're into social media if you know what a oh, boomerang wow. is then you're down with the kids <laughs> i didn't so i i failed the test as well but um oh yeah so this was the question uh rian mcgee she tweeted back and she said uh who would win in a in a fair dig you or pat burke <laughs> was that a fight I don't know. I think it's a fight, yeah. <laughs> it's a fight he would win because, you know, he's a southpaw. He's a lefty. Oh, he's lefty. You know, yeah. Pat, is, you know, Pat is a physical specimen. Yeah. You know, at 6'10", he can do, like, well, well, back in the day, he could do 12 behind-the-head pull-ups like this. 
know, right. you know, which at six ten, you're carrying all that that's weight. That's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, actually. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, Pat was, you know, he he, you know, he's a little bit older now, but fifteen years ago, man, he was a physical specimen. You know, I mean, he could mm -hmm. really finish a lot. You know, fit dunk shots and really take the ball hard to the rim. Um, so I would say definitely if, if on a one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know, you know, he didn't have the inside pivot. He didn't have the pump fake, you know, all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. He, 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 you definitely had a more, well, I, probably, I don't know if it's fair to say it, but like he, he definitely more like a physical game. Yeah. Uh, he had a more physical, and he was, you know, I mean, if, if you were playing like, you know, he played with a great player like Steve Nash or, or players like that, he'd probably be more valuable than that to me because he's such a great finisher. You know, Steve would throw him a pass. You know, I didn't have the athletic ability to really go to that rim and just ram it through. But, I mean, Pat, man, some of his dunks were just thunderous. I mean, really impressive stuff. Yeah, he was a phenomenal athlete, actually. I didn't realize just how much of it. And aggressive as well, because when you, when you watch his highlights, when he dunks the ball, it doesn't look like there's too many guys. I saw when he was playing for Barcelona, there's some highlights there, and he's he breaks the, you know, he's like, He's just tearing the rim down, you know. He's he's yeah. he's really that kind of player. So he's yeah, kind of yeah. Did you actually? Would you played in Spain? Did you? Is that right? Fun yeah, Labrada. Yeah. Yeah, Fun Labrada. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's right outside of Madrid. What's the level there like that there versus the NBA? Spain. Sp I always felt the Spanish league was probably the se is the second best. Second best in the world. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, the whole Argentinian team. So this is like 2004. They won the Olympics in 2004. So besides Manu Ginobili, the whole team was playing in Spain. So all those great players that would win the gold medal were all playing in Spain. All those Argentinians. Why wow, did not? Yeah, it was. It was. It's a. It's a. It was. It still is an incredible league, man. Yeah, you know, it's, it's got to be the best. At the time, it was the best league in Europe. I, I can't say now though. I haven't, I haven't really studied it as much. Yeah, it's generally considered the second second best league, but it's just interesting to hear you say that, having gone played in the NBA, to say that it's, it's still an amazing league. Oh, it was incredible. It was incredible, you know. Like I said, all those Argentinians that won the gold medal, every, every one of them was playing in Spain professionally that year. Yeah, I, I think Manu was in a, in an Italian league before he came to the NBA. Right. Manu was played – I played against Manu in 2001 – I was playing for Verona, Italy, beautiful city in Italy. Yeah. And he was playing for Vitris Bologna. Bologna, yes, that's yeah, right. Bologna yeah. is a beautiful city in central Italy. And um, he was on, it was probably at the time, he was probably on the best team in Europe. And it was him, uh, Rigadou, a French guard, a very good French guard, and then Marco Zaric. Yeah, Zaric. Was on the NBA. Yeah. And everybody knew that Marco Zaric and Manu were both at the time had been drafted and the, the next season they were going to, or the season after, they were going to go to the NBA and play. I mean, and Manu was a very, very good player. Did I have any idea? My imagination wasn't good enough to, to work and understand how great a career he had. I mean, it was just a mind-boggling career. But, you know, I knew he was going to be a good NBA player, but I don't think anybody had any idea he got the kind of career that he did in the NBA. Yeah, and maybe it was because Popovich, even though he's quite strict in a way, he, he let him play, same as Tony Parker, kind of allowed him to just play his game. But he's such a creative player that you could almost would have thought that if he went to somewhere like playing in a system like that, it wouldn't have worked, but yeah. it just worked perfectly. So it was yeah, that's, a, that, that's funny. That's funny because that's what I always say. I go, you know, a lot of it's luck, you know, if, if he didn't go to such a great organization, you know, obviously with great players, and then obviously with what, maybe the best NBA coach in history or one of the top three, four in, in Coach Popovich, you know, who knows? You know, he might have got down on himself or, you know, he'd been playing like that isolation basketball. But he went to an organization that, you know, really knew its stuff and, you know, the rest is history. Mm. And actually, interestingly, it's interesting the top coaches, how they <clears> – <throat> they seem to be more flexible around certain players. Like you see yeah. with, in the last dance with Rodman, he allowed him to go to Vegas halfway through yeah. the playoffs. 
like they kind of know the personnel the personnel management part of it is actually sometimes seems to be what's separating these top coaches they know how to manage those players and get the best out of them, which is incredible yeah yeah um well you know i played for uh pat riley i played for two two great oh, nba coaches i played for george carl in seattle my rookie year and he was a brilliant coach and then i played for pat riley you know two two very different coaches um but um both you know really very um insightful guys they would always look at the team at different angles and, and try to find different ways to um uh unique ways to motivate the team um you know really be really think about how they're going to communicate to the team and how they could be different and if, if teams get in ruts coming with unique and um original ideas to get the team playing again um so you know i was fortunate to play for both those two guys i mean they were both like great great coaches the pat pat riley that's really interesting by the way um, pat riley was was it was it his uh as you say like what you talked about there was it the way he kind of um uh, motivated people with true words that made him so good or was it more his x's and o's it sounds like it well it, all, all of the above oh everything okay but like i said you know he was very different you know he he had a solid rotation of eight guys you know that's what you know so he his coaching style was very different than George Carl's, where, you know, George Carl had much more um, um, pressure defense, uh, much more full court defense. Um, you know, he was more relaxed around the players than Pat Riley was. So there were different approaches, but um, they're both, I would have to say, very cerebral guys. And they would always try to find, like I said, you know, repeat myself, you know, regional ways uh to, to to motivate the team when the team needed that motivation you know which you know i, I they both probably you know they they worked very hard but they also had a, a gift and knack of coaching you know that yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people can kind of pick up on you okay know, you know, they just had a you know, they had a knack yeah they just had something that did, yeah. did separated them as coaches yeah but um yeah, you know, Greg, I never played with Greg Popovich, but I, I um, he's a great guy, man. Very friendly guy, very down to earth. You know, he's led a fantastic life. You know, he speaks fluent Russian. <laughs> yeah, he was a, yeah, he was, because um, he, 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 he went to the Air Force and then afterwards he was a uh, Russian major. And uh, uh, there was a time that he was at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow in the early 70s and he was, you know, a translator or stuff like that. Wow. Guy led a, guys led a fantastic life. <laughs> That's incredible. I did not know that. Because uh, it seems to me that there's a, a theme with the, some of these coaches. Well. Like Coach K went through the army as well. Popovich it seems to give them that toughness or that discipline. Or the organizational part seems to be just on point. Um, yeah, I just I chatted to somebody else. Uh, I d just releasing the podcast tomorrow, actually. And he was a team manager at Duke. And was under Coach K, and he said he went to one of the best leadership schools. It was an army training school, and he said this, he's just such a good leader, and he learned a lot in that academy. It's one of the best places. Yeah. I can't remember the name of it actually, but uh, it's just interesting that you can start to see themes of like the things, the characteristics of these people who who are very good. There's just kind of yeah, seem to be themes across them, and, and it's, yeah. it's a good one to pick up on for them. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so then the other coach that somebody asked me to ask you about was Patino. Was he a different style, just in terms of his basketball coach? I know he had a little bit of, um, yeah, so allegations around the, the recruitment side of things. And then yeah, yeah, he, yeah, it's a shame. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, college basketball is very different than the um, NBA. It's apples and oranges. So, but I mean, to me, the NBA is, you know, it's the ultimate basketball and, and to be an NBA coach, you need to be a, to be a successful NBA coach, you have to be a master coach. So, um, you know, the NBA style of coach is just much more complex than, than you know, college coaching. So Yeah. Uh, J Jay Laranaga, he was on the national team. He's now an assistant, isn't he, at Boston? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, you know, he hopefully he's going to be getting a head coaching job very soon. Oh, cool. So, yeah, yeah. Keep your fingers crossed, you know, because yeah. – you know, he's, he's got a great reputation throughout the NBA. Um, you know, he's, you know, he was a very good player and he's going to be a great, great coach. So we're hoping, you know, 
hoping, fingers crossed, you know, maybe he'll get one, you know, one of these openings. He'll see Jay Laranega head coach. That would be incredible. I mean, his dad was a bit of a legend, so I guess he was always going to get there. But he, it was interesting. He was on Pat Price's podcast. I don't know if you've been listening to those ones. Basketball Journeys, they're quite good. Um, there's a plug for Pat now. Um, but yeah, it was just interesting to hear him talk about the fact that he thought he knew a lot because his dad was obviously a legendary coach, a uh, college coach. But he said he just realized how much he didn't actually know when he came to Boston. And there's even like small things. He starts talking about like spacing and things like that. The, the, the detail, the level of detail you get to uh, at that level is just something different he hadn't experienced yeah. really. So it was quite interesting yeah. to hear that. Yeah. The NBA yeah. coaching is, you know, is definitely, you know, I can't say, you know, European coaching is very good too. Like we talked about the Spanish league, but definitely in the States, it's the highest uh, level of, you know, the amount of, um, decisions you have to make each game as an NBA coach um, besides motivation rotations everything like that it's uh, it's very complex right so, it takes a special kind of coach to be able to to do with all that I suppose yeah so cool uh, okay I just I thought there was another question there um, oh yeah I've got two I always put in three random questions at the end Marty uh, right, so one I have already asked you this one. Do you use social media? So you don't really. So that's that's yeah. cool. Uh, oh, I, I did forget one thing. The the Marty uh, shot form. I never actually quizzed you. On that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so on this one, uh, uh, the question I wanted to ask you was. So you be, I have a ball here just to demonstrate, just in case anyone hasn't seen it. I'll put up a photo. But your arm used to be. Yeah. Like, I mean that's not yeah, even just like that. Just like that. Yeah. Just like that. Was this it taught? Was it would just naturally. Because there was guys back in the day that would shoot like behind their head in the 90s yeah. and have different shot forms. Like David Robinson was very kind of, you know, right angle with the, like that, yeah. with the arm. Yeah, it would just, the arm just naturally, the left arm would naturally just fall into this place. Huh. Yeah, okay. it, was just like, uh, it was like a natural, uh, you know, into, into my shoulder right here would just fall naturally like this right now. <laughs> well, maybe because it's more work for me to hold it this way this just kind of folds in here and just like that but everything is the same you know this is my guide hand so yeah and you still released it with one hand it was just yeah yeah, yeah. It was just the arm would just kind of make that that form like there <laughs> yeah because yeah, i was first time i saw it i was like He's got funky form for, and then I was like, he doesn't, he doesn't miss, like, so I'm not going to question it. And if you do yeah. the same thing every time, as you know, you get reps yeah. up, it doesn't really matter. You can shoot it wherever you want. But we ever, did anyone ever try and correct it, or did you, is that naturally the way you shot? And then did any, that was just naturally a shot. And, you know, I never really thought about it until I got to the NBA and then people started remarking on it. Right. And, right. and then I was like, oh, yeah, you know, but I, I, that was just the naturally my uh, my left arm, my off arm, the guide hand, would just naturally set in that position, just like this. And yeah. I didn't really think much of it. And then years went by, and it was it was it wasn't until I got to the CBA NBA that people were like remarking on it. And I was like, hey, you know, that's my that's my signature. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I kind of I, I put in my tweet. I don't know if it was correct. I was like, uh, you know, remembered for his un unorthodox. Uh, I suppose unorthodox. I don't know if that's the right word, but yeah. you know, something like that. Like that was one of the things. Like w when I first watched you, I was like, wow, he's shooting for him. But back in the nineties, again, there was probably more variation on the way people would hold the ball and shoot it. Yeah. Uh, and clearly, like it wasn't told. You weren't like told by. Like, did you ever feel like you were um, underestimated? Like, because you were like a tall, kind of had a had a funny shot. Do you ever feel like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, all the time, all the time. Yeah, that's what I thought. Because you, you know, get but, you know, they use that as a more motivation. You know, you know. I mean, I wasn't drafted to the NBA, so you know that that was a motivation for for me to try to make it. That you know, hey, you know, you, you know, I, you miss me. Or, but I also think that. Um, my time in the CBA, uh, you know, as a young player, getting all that all that playing time, um, you know, with with NBA rules and more of an open style of play than college was probably more conducive towards my game. Right. Okay, I got gotcha. you. But uh, ultimately, that probably allowed you to be successful and then get the call up. The fact that you got all the minutes. Yeah. Okay. 
Cool. That's really awesome, Mary. Uh, again, I have tons more questions as, as a lot of people that come on do. Uh, I'll finish up on this one as a random. So what does Marty have in his headphones today? I assume you listen to music. You mentioned the Beatles. Yeah. And what did you have when you were playing in the NBA in the 90s? Did that evolve? Uh, have you, has your music taste changed? Well, but I mean, no, you know what? I'm a huge, I'm a huge, uh, back in the 90s and now, I think I'm on his um, fan club. I'm a huge Bob Seger fan. Bob, Bob Seger. Seger? Bob Seger, big Bob Seger fan. Maybe the state of Michigan, because Bob Seger and the Silver Bullet Band, they're from Michigan. And now what I'm listening to now is uh, I listen to a lot of Jack White. Jack White from the White Stripes. Yeah. Ah, very good. Both those guys are both from Michigan. So. And wh why Michigan? I, I actually spent a summer in Michigan. I, I know Michigan yeah. quite well. Uh, where, so is there any reason Michigan or just you just like Michigan? Oh, just, no, no, no. This, I'm just fans of those two, um, those two guys. You know, artists. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I'm just a huge Bob Seger fan. I'm a huge Jack White fan. And they just both happen to be from Michigan. <laughs> right. Magic Johnson's from Michigan. So, you know. Magic Johnson. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that. Well, Magic Johnson's from Michigan. Yeah, okay. Jack White, he's done a lot of kind of acoustic stuff, more acoustic stuff now. So that's what I heard late, like more recently. But yeah, I haven't he listened does, to him. He does it all. Yeah, you know, he, okay. he does it all. He's, you know, he's kind of like the LeBron James of rock and roll, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, I, I actually like Jack White as well. He's really good. I like, I like the White Stripes. Bob Seger, interestingly, I've, doesn't seem to have, uh, I've not been exposed to his stuff and I'd be fairly yeah, into music. He love it, listen to his stuff, Bob Seger. Right. He, he loves his stuff, you know, I mean, he's he's older now, you know, so I mean, he's, you know, contemporary, you know, 70s, 80s, but, you know, you'll hear his songs, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. He's a very talented guy. Okay, I'll give him a listen. Um, right. So the, uh, there was one other thing. Did you meet up with, the, I think, Pat or Justin? Uh, Norton mentioned that you guys met up recently. Did you add some of the oh, no, no, American? No, no, we So, you know, um, I have, you know, um, besides everything else, uh, basketball, I'm a, I'm a real uh, renaissance man. I helped produce one of Justin's movies. Ah. Justin directed a movie. Yeah, Riff Raff. It was actually Riff -raff. a movie, Riff Raff, and it was about lifeguards in Chicago, you know, obviously Lake Michigan there. Lake Michigan. Yeah. And it was, it was an exciting, like, coming-of-age story you know, that took place in Chicago. And uh, I was a, um, I'm a movie producer of Justin's work. And then That's now amazing. Justin, and then, you know, Justin's been in Los Angeles now many years, so we reconnected. Um, and then I read his excellent screenplay, The Mighty Murphy's screenplay. So, um, you know, he wanted me to read I read it. I thought it was hilarious. Um, you know, he's, 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 a, uh, he's another talented Blue Westerner, Chicago guy. But, uh, yeah, so uh, we connected. You know, Justin was Justin's a great guy, very talented guy um, on the court and off the court. So uh, he's just a really good friend of mine. Yeah, Justin's great. Uh, that podcast coming out, I'll send you the link. Uh, we had a really good chat about movies and comedy and stuff like that. Yeah. He seems to be have a lot of interest. Sounds like you do too. Um, yeah. He actually sent that script, and actually, I think he sent your email on in the script, and it's called Red Legs. And it's about the first uh, wave of slavery that went over to America that had some Irish people in the boats. Really interesting. Oh, really? Kind of lesser told story. Yeah, yeah. They kind of, you wrote that. Uh, so he he's written a full uh, transcript, uh, and I was reading this. So it's worth reading that. That's fantastic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll text him later today until we get that. You know, I mean, Mighty Murphy's is hilarious, but that sounds pretty serious stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, look at the the topic is a bit. Uh, yeah, it's a bit yeah, serious, but fun, but so. but he's a fantastic writer. I mean, I was so impressed with the the transcripts that he sent me. Anyway, mm -hmm. I don't. I've never read scripts before, but I I was impressed. Anyway, so. Yeah, no, that's no, quite cool. That. That's cool. Okay, Marty, I'm just aware of time. It's All right. 12 o'clock here, but just to say a million thank yous for coming on because it you was got a, shot, it. My pleasure, man. a shot in the dark for me, uh, but I really wanted to get you on because, uh, yeah, like, I mean, from the first time I saw you, I was like, this is amazing that you're playing on the national team and you were in the NBA for so many years. So it was really pleasure. Well, just, just understand that, you know, it was a dream come true to play in the NBA and it was a dream come true to play for Ireland, you know, it was, you know, it was my honor to have that opportunity. That's amazing.
Yeah, well, look, um, I, I don't know if Basketball Ireland still talk to you, but I'm sure there's some time in the future there'll be an opportunity to come over. And if you do... That'd be um, awesome. After yeah. this whole COVID thing, I'd love to get back. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we can maybe see if there's any of the guys... Uh, Mike Bree's not around anymore. He's in Sweden or whatever. But uh, yeah, sure. We can stay in touch anyway. And right. thanks thanks once again for sharing the story. It was, it was amazing. All right. All right. All right. Cheers, Marty. Thanks very much. Thank you.